Hi everyone, and um, thank you, Michael, for that um, introduction. And I should um, pay particular credit to Michael and his colleague Anna Maria Sicani, who have um, created this program that's looking at refailing failure during this year. And it's my great pleasure to be chairing this session with wonderful panelists who are going to be looking at DH broken between experimentation and degradation. Uh, and we have until roughly 6.15 UK time today. Uh, and we're going to start off with a couple of questions from me uh, with our panelists answering, and then we'll open it up for wider discussion. So just to introduce everybody very briefly, we have with us today um, Gentry Sayers, who's Associate Professor of English and Director of the Praxis Studio for Comparative Media Studies at the University of Victoria. Uh, he's the editor of three books, including Making Things and Drawing Boundaries, published with the University of Minnesota Press. Ariana Tula is Director and Senior Research Software Analyst at King's Digital Lab, King's College London, and she has broad experience in digital humanities research and teaching, research management and digital research infrastructures. Next, we have Franny Corey, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Pennsylvania's Center on Digital Culture and Society. And she earned her PhD in communication at the University of Southern California's Allenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Franny's work focuses on critical historical approaches to information with emphasis on the prehistories and afterlives of data intensive systems. Sara Namusogo Kale is a lecturer in the Department of Journalism and Communication at Makera University. Her work focuses on print and digital multimedia journalism, and she's currently researching multimedia storytelling for archiving COVID-19 experiences in Uganda. She's also exploring multimedia production and use for online teaching and learning. And last but not least, we have Jenny Mitchum, who, as she says, began her career getting muddy and wet on archaeological digs, so rapidly moved to working in an office with computers. And that's how she got into digital preservation. After working for 15 years as a digital archivist at the University of York, she's now head of good practice and standards at the Digital Preservation Coalition and has been working closely with the UK De Nuclear Decommissioning Authority on their uh, particular digital preservation challenges. So thank you all so much for joining us. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you over the next uh, little more than an hour or so. So to get things started, you all engage with brokenness in your work in some way, whether as an object to study or as a reality in your own projects. Can you briefly discuss an example of how brokenness plays out in your own work? And perhaps we can start with Jenny. Thanks, Jane. Um, so yes, hi everyone. Um, so as Jane said, I work in digital preservation, and I guess the work of a digital archivist is partly about trying to fix broken digital objects. So you might be all aware of the fragile nature of digital content. So all that stuff we're creating on our computers today is incredibly fragile. It can get damaged or become obsolete um, really easily. But there are things that we do as digital archivists to help reduce that loss and damage. So just to give an example of brokenness in my work, um, so as Jane mentioned in a previous job, I worked as a, a digital archivist. And at one point in that job, I encountered a set of five and a quarter inch floppy disks hidden away in a box deep in the archives. And I realized that it was my job to preserve these. So a quick show of hands, if you've got a handy five and a quarter inch floppy disk reader lying around or attached to your computer. Um, no, I, I didn't think there'd be many takers. Oh, Jen Teresa says maybe. Um, so this is pretty niche. Uh, these aren't the, the hard little floppy disks we were using in the 90s even. These were bigger and floppier and older. So first, of course, there was that initial challenge of, of getting the data off those disks. Um, and that highlighted that some of the disks were already broken. Um, they were corrupt. They were unreadable. I couldn't fix those. Um, and next was trying to work out what the digital content on the disks that we could read actually was. And again, that's much easier said than done when the software that was used in the 1980s is no longer kind of actually installed on your computer. Um, so you can't just double click on them and open them. And also um, the use of file extensions wasn't even standardized. So in the early days of home computing, people were literally encouraged to use that three character file extension, however they liked. Um, so how do you even work out what software you need to locate and um, 
access and preserve that sort of content. So after a short investigation, I eventually discovered that these files were WordStar files. So for those of you who don't know, WordStar was a very early, actually quite pioneering uh, word processing application. So one of the first before uh, Microsoft Office took over and perhaps even WordPerfect. So I did manage to get a copy of WordStar working on an old computer so that I could have a look at them. Some of them were already broken. Um, so they had areas of corruption um, within the text. So areas where the text just turned to gibberish, just characters that you couldn't read. So I couldn't fix um, that level of brokenness. But ultimately I had to work out how to rescue the content so that people could access it in some way. Um, so obviously it's not reasonable to suggest that everyone needs to maintain an obsolete computer in the corner of their office with a copy of WordStar on if they ever wanted to access those files. These files were um, screenplays uh, that had been written in the 1980s for television. Uh, so this led to further explorations of brokenness and failure. So it turned out it was impossible to accurately replicate everything about these files in a modern file format. So whatever I did was in some ways flawed, there would always be things missing. Uh, so I could create a migrated copy of the content as PDF, um, for example, and that might include all the right words on the page in the right order and perhaps some of the formatting, but it wasn't possible to get all the formatting right in the migrated copy and not always possible to capture or even understand the exact intent of the original author of those files. And I should, of course, say out loud, there's no save as PDF um, type option in WordStar 4. It, it's not that easy. Um, so perhaps more importantly, how could I actually try and replicate the experience of viewing and interacting with a very early word processing file in its native and very basic habitat? So there's no mouse, for example, when you're using WordStar 4. That really threw me as I was trying to work through these documents kept on wiggling the mouse and, and wondering where the cursor was and it never appeared, of course. So if you want to do anything in WordStar, you need to use keystroke commands. Um, those keystroke commands are really not intuitive at all, especially not for us today when we're so used to modern word processing with their fancy intuitive interfaces. Um, so perhaps you know some users of these files who came to the archive wanted to access them would want to experience that whole um, experience of interacting with an early word processor, and I couldn't replicate that. So what I'm describing here, um, and I'm about to wrap up, but what I'm describing is a very imperfect piece of digital preservation, a very imperfect uh, file migration, but I think that's kind of par for the course in the work that we do, and I think it's, it's sort of equally as important to, to recognize our failures and accept a certain amount of brokenness in what we do. And most importantly, being honest and upfront with people that are using those files. So those migrated PDFs that I've created that are imperfect in so many ways is sort of being upfront and saying, you know, this is what I did. This is what didn't work. This is why they're still slightly broken. So that was just a little case study of the sort of uh, thing that I do in digital preservation with regards to brokenness. Thank you very much, Jenny, and shows how reliant we are on people with your expertise um, to recover uh, even broken information. Um, Ariana, next, please. Yes, thank you, and nice seeing, seeing everybody in the list. Um, so my perspective comes from as a um, uh, Jane Several King's Digital Lab, which is a research, research software engineering unit embedded in the Faculty of Arts and Humanities at King's College London. And as a premise, one of our core activities is actually to maintain a substantial state of public facing digital research outputs. Um, so if I can be a bit more abstract about my example, I would say that the most common example of how we engage and experience brokenness is via colleagues. So partners mainly in this project, but also the public, because a lot of these resources are out there for others um, to consult and to use. Um, so it's about them reporting that a site or a specific functionality is down or not working. And this might vary from images are not showing up for this um, particular digital edition to the search functionality is broken to the site is completely down. Um, so it depends. Um, given the size of the public facing digital resource that we maintain, which is around 120 at the moment, and the fact that some of these projects date back to the end of the 90s, you can imagine that these requests are quite frequent and quite various. Um, we have also obviously our own internal monitoring mechanism to check the health of our service and application. For example, today we had something 
that wasn't working due to uh, external mainly systems, so not necessarily dependent on us, but on the on the college uh, ITS systems. Um, but one can never underestimate the level of granularity that might come in terms of um, brokenness of functionalities from users that are actually used to use these resources in very specific ways. Um, so even with our monitoring, high level monitoring, we don't catch those and they come via this reporting. So once a bug report or, or the other kind of alert or brokenness reaches the lab, it is usually discussed. And depending on the urgency, we use our Slack channel, which is constantly open for communication within the team, or if it's not that urgent or so um, um, high priority, let's say we wait for our weekly team meetings to discuss it. And then once we have a sense of the kind of issue and how we can address it, um, usually the project manager get back to the initiator of that request with a possible analysis of what might be wrong. Um, and when we can, we give some kind of plan of action to fix it. Now, the main actors in this maintenance process, if you like, are usually our system managers, one and a half people, slash two, depending on time. Um, and they are key to investigate usually the issue, the cause, and more often than not also how to act about it. Um, but depending on the project architecture, so again, how old, how complex, um, in the research context, more often than not, also other members of the team have to chip in. So it's quite a sometimes holistic and complex approach. So developers and analysts also need to intervene. Um, and if a broken functionality is reported for a project that we have under service, service level agreement, so there is a contract that we are maintaining this thing, uh, we have the responsibility obviously to investigate it quickly and, and act quickly as, as much as we can. So I'm gonna share on the on the chat in a moment um, our SLA template so that people can look at those um, in their own time if they're curious. Um, because I think it gives a sense, especially the guidance doc document gives a sense of how we approach this kind of brokenness as endemic um, in our processes, as Jenny was also saying. So one could say that um, for a, an RSC, so a research software engineering team, deeply engaged with the mechanics of technical system and processes, brokenness is a risk with very high probability and its mitigations or countermeasures are not an option, but a necessity. Um, and again, if you're curious, you could also look a little bit more detail at our archiving and sustainability program. So I'll link, uh, put another link in the chat here. Um, I think this is again an example of dealing with material obsolescence, as um, um, as Jenny said. But in our case, in particular, in relation with what some people refer to as sunsetting of digital products, and also the change uncertainty in a reserve production context, which spans from long tail outputs to very ephemeral experiments. So in some cases, things don't need to last, but some aspect of those outputs might need to last um, or be functional for for a longer period. Um, so again, maybe to, to, to wrap up, one could say that I think the failure of sustaining project beyond the limited funding period and the failure to understand the financial, technical, and also human cost of sustaining a rich portfolio of digital projects has turned, in a sense, for the lab at least, into an opportunity, namely the opportunity to review critically and creatively our software development life cycle. And when I say creatively, if you look at that archiving and sustainability program, you will see that similar to what Jenny says, um, sometimes archiving and sustaining something doesn't mean sustain it as it was, but sustain some aspects of, of those resources. So brokenness remains endemic nonetheless. Um, that's how I think I can conclude. Thank you, Ariana. I'm, I'm sure we'll come back to that question of resourcing and how many people are involved in dealing with brokenness. But there's also a nice contrast between the public and the private, between yours and Jenny's examples of the ticking clock when your brokenness is visible outside your own institution. Um, great. Sarah, next. OK, so uh, thank you, everybody, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, interesting that Ariana should talk about the resources, the finances of sustaining a project, because I find that um, one of the, the things that the platforms that I'm looking at called Picture suffered actually died because it lacked financing. But let me just go back a few steps. So I approach brokenness from from um, a research perspective, but uh, most importantly, uh, last year I was approached by 
by a group uh, by a team that was putting together a special edition of um of the internet history journal and they were looking at um, dead and dying platforms and so they uh, put out this call and you know they encouraged people from the global south to participate and all and so it got me thinking um what what are those are there any platforms that that have died in uganda do we have any that would consider dead and it also got me thinking what is platform death anyway would we consider um, a, a platform transforming from uh, maybe one personality to another death as well or do we consider um, death as when a platform stops to exist and it's archived and you know we we relegate it to to history and then we start researching about it and and studying it and so um while i was i was thinking i <laughs> i thought about a platform that i worked with as um as a student straight out of university as an intern at um the new vision newspaper in kampala the at that time that was about 2001 2002 um and in uganda that's when the internet was just picking up and media houses were all going online so new vision which is one of the leading dailies had started on that project and so i was recruited to to be one of the people um working on on their online platforms and one of the platforms that we worked on was called enter uganda so enter uganda was um, a portal that provided business information about uganda and targeted um especially ugandans in the diaspora among the many things we did was to have a section on you know brief news that has appeared in the new vision that day but also to make sure that the information is refreshed and um um usable when the when the users need it so i worked with enter uganda for a while it went on um it worked really well really really well and then i left the company and you know went to do other things and of course um online publishing um picked up and you know it's what it is today and enter uganda suddenly is no more. So when this call came out, I thought about Enter Uganda, went back to the website, to you know, the internet, checked, and it was a strange page that came up. I couldn't recognize it. And so I thought, oh, actually, Enter Uganda is dead. And so I, I decided to <laughs> reach out to some of the uh, people that I had worked with to interview them because I wanted to put together this paper. Guess what? I wasn't able to put the paper together because one, no one wanted to talk. The ones who could talk had forgotten almost everything about Enter Uganda. And so my paper fell apart. And um, I found dealing with that was a bit hard, but it also got me thinking about um, what platform death actually means. And how it um it affects people people who who worked on those platforms people um who have used the platforms where are they and all that and uh the second platform that uh, i considered is called pic show and i spoke to the developer who describes pic show as um a social networking app that um you know an african social networking app that uh, he originally set out to have as um, people sharing images and 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 video, something similar to maybe Snapchat or Instagram. But before all this came up, before these other apps came up, and so he developed this um, this platform. He put it out. I got to know about it from someone I followed on Twitter, and so I installed the app on my phone. Guess what? I think I. I felt like I was the only one using using the app. Anyway, over time, the app, um, over time, the app was no more. Um, I tried to get it and it says the, the app is crashing. It can't, you know, you can't access it and all. So I reached out to this developer because I knew somebody who knew him. And he's very frustrated. He's he 
because he feels like he's up. I told him, I feel like your, your platform was dead um, on arrival because you try to do something similar to the big ones like WhatsApp and Telegram and people had already picked up on this. So what difference did you think you were going to make? But anyway, long story short, um, I think um, finances, human resource and all these affect um, the lifespan of, um, of platforms and they contribute to their living or their dying early or eventually. And so that's my, my experience with, um, with uh, platform death. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. There are so many common themes emerging around resourcing already, but I also love that you've brought in the oral history side of it and the assumption that people will remember it wasn't that long ago, but it turns out that they don't. Um, wonderful, thank you. And Franny, next. Hi, everyone. Um, one, thank you for inviting me. I've already learned so much and have enjoyed hearing about all these things. Um, and especially Sarah, I'm excited to talk a little more about some of the commonalities that, that we might have. Um, so my, I'm gonna talk about brokenness in the context of um, my current major project, which looks to the process of social media platform sunsetting or closure um, and content deletion through interviews with former employees, some who have good memories, some who don't have such good memories, um, from platforms largely based in the US um, that have closed. Uh, and that's included sites like MySpace, Friendster, GeoCities, Vine, uh, and a handful of others. Um, and this project looked to these sites not only to like ask what it actually looks like socially and technically to shut a social media platform down, but also um, how we can view uh, brokenness and breakdown as sort of socio-technically designed almost as much as the creation of a system, um, but also to look at what remains after they've closed um, and how that's going to come to shape cultural memory. Um, so brokenness and failure sort of pervade this work in some obvious ways and maybe in some non-obvious ways, but one of the most interesting things that I found um, was that brokenness was always sort of contextual and relational. Um, and the idea of brokenness or the idea of failure was sort of mobilized um, and defined by different actors and different employees, uh, depending on their particular social context. Um, so this came out most clearly in the case of Friendster, uh, which I have an article in that internet history's special issue, so maybe I'll uh, link it. Um, but so Friendster was a, a social media platform founded in San Francisco, uh, California, in Silicon Valley in 2002. Um, you could think of it as having sort of similar capabilities to like an early Facebook. Um, it grew very rapidly. It had tons of like blue chip Silicon Valley investment. Um, and it was largely associated with a user base that was like the young, hip tech scene of Silicon Valley um, and some other major metro centers in the US. At least this is like, if you're gonna read articles about it, this is sort of what it would be associated with. But at the same time, um, the platform had become extremely popular in Southeast Asia and the Philippines and Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and the user base there actually rapidly exceeded the user base that was more talked about in the United States. Um, so Friendster in those early years experienced a lot of technical breakage. Um, its servers would fall over, it had slow load times, really long down times um, as it sort of tried to handle the crush of user traffic. Um, in those years, it also experienced some like managerial mishap and like competitors like MySpace and Facebook. Um, so in the mid 2000s, uh, sort of US based use of Friendster really tapered off as people went to MySpace and Facebook uh, to the point that by the mid to late 2000s, Friendster was like largely considered, again, in sort of popular press articles that were coming out in the United States, was, it was largely considered dead, a total failure, you know, broken, gone. Uh, people were performing autopsies of Friendster to figure out what had, what broke it. Um, at the same time, however, like in uh, around 2008, Friendster was very much still functioning and alive. Um, in 2008 was the largest social network in Asia. So uh, we have this sort of like 
contrasting discourses between brokenness and total vitality. Um, and it, it just kind of goes to show as one of the, th one of the things that really came out of this project was how people experience uh, socio-technical breakage uh, and, and define it um, in very different ways. So I'll end there. Thank you very much, Fanny. I'm so struck as well by the language around all of this, the kind of gentle sounding sunsetting that the platforms talk about compared to death and autopsies that uh, that you and Sarah have been mentioning. And I think that that's interesting around attitudes towards brokenness and the impact that it has on people and trying to pretend that it isn't brokenness, it's something else. But, um, and finally, for this question, um, Gentry. Hey, everyone, can you hear me OK? Yeah. All right. Um, thanks again. Yeah, for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm at the University of Victoria on uh, Lekwungen and Wet'suwet'en territories, uh, and I'm going to talk today a little bit um, for the first question here about a project we had at UVic. Uh, ran from about 2014 to about 2018, maybe 2019, um, called Prototyping the Past. Uh, and the idea here uh, was started with uh, media history projects and uh, specifically uh, work I was doing that came out of my dissertation work on early magnetic recording uh, in the late 19th century. Um, and when you're doing this kind of historical work, I think a lot of people are familiar with, especially work that's in the 19th and, and early 20th century, um, that you encounter a lot of you know, flat representations of these devices, uh, you know, drawings, sketches, uh, you know, uh, diagrams of various sorts. Um, and if you go to archives, often um, these, these materials may not be there because they're technologies, right? Or if they are there, they don't work. Um, or if you've seen them in a book, you wonder if they ever did work, right? So we started to kind of investigate these early uh, devices. Um, and we're, especially as a lab, really interested in um, the notion of obsolescence, planned obsolescence included, brokenness, um, and what we might learn from devices that uh, had, didn't persist. And so I guess it, it kind of made sense at the time uh, to draw. I think we drew heavily, uh, for instance, on the work of Daniela Rosner, uh, uh, Rosner's work on care and repair movements. Um, and we did a lot of uh, computer numerical control and rapid prototyping work in our lab. Um, and I guess like uh, rhetorically and methodologically, um, that aligned with this, this discourse around brokenness uh, and repair maintenance, um, because um, a lot of the rapid prototyping work is about constantly trying things over and over again. So within the lab context, there was a kind of palpable affect of frustration because <laughs> things were often kind of trial and error. Uh, many of us were in the humanities, so we were learning, for example, how to use a router, right, or a laser cutter, right? So there was a learning curve there, uh, learning like health code considerations around these sort of devices, right, on a university campus too. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll point to one example, uh, and, and I'll link to it here uh, in the chat. Um, but one I want to just kind of briefly talk about really just for a minute is uh, what was called the reading optophone. Uh, roughly from the 1910s to the 1960s. Uh, and we, we worked to kind of remake this uh, device, not necessarily recreate it, but remake it to understand how it worked. And what the reading optophone did um, was it, it was basically, it helped blind readers uh, translate type into audible tones. So basically uh, uh, blind operators would learn over time to distinguish kind of patterns of tones as words or phrases. Uh, and there's a lot of research that kind of demonstrates now that the reading optophone was a kind of technical and social precursor to optical care character recognition, you know, where you, you convert page images into machine readable text. Um, and a kind of thing that I've really started to notice over time um, on the, with respect to the, again, the discourse on brokenness and repair, um, was it a key theme for us as the, in the lab? Um, was it so much um, why they broke um, or that the fact that they were broken or the fact that they didn't persist, but rather how the systems that they were functioning in, the social technical systems failed them? Right. And so like in the last instance, a lot of the questions we had around brokenness and prototyping the past came came about like about systematic or systemic failures. So, for example, you know, why is it that, um, you know, routinely I think we have many answers for this, but for why is it that, you know, say, for example, capital systems routinely fail disabled users and disabled technicians? Or, you know, why is it that routinely uh, efficient uh, systems that are premised on efficiency uh, fail experimentation? You know, why is it that we often 
often think of um, brokenness at the project level and constantly repairing and maintaining something, um, when we could also talk about, for, for example, the pressures of having to keep maintaining things and, and, and in a moment of precarity and you know, you know, budget restraints. Um, so I think that was a kind of key thing for us was to think about maybe toggling between or moving between the idea of the broken project or the broken device, the device that no longer works, and can you bring it back into the, the present? Can you repair it? But also thinking about its systemic context, both today and, 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 and historically, um, specifically when the systems has, have failed uh, developers, users, and, and communities of practice. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I really like that that moving between the different contexts and from the mm. micro to the macro. And you mentioned care in there as well, which I think is the, the first time that's been explicitly talked about in relation to brokenness, as well as, you know, repairing and maintaining or deciding not to. But I think that care aspect of it is really striking as well. Uh, just a reminder to all of you um, listening, if you have any questions that occur to you as you're going along, um, you're very welcome to drop them into the chat or you can save them till the end and uh, raise your digital hands and I will bring you in. So moving on to our second question for our panelists, you've all already talked about this to a significant extent, but perhaps we can focus even more on the intersection of the technological and the social and cultural. Some of you look at how online platforms break or die, as we've heard, and the impact that has on user communities and researchers. Others of you examine how the process of software development has the potential to break down. Can you talk about the human dimensions of brokenness in your work? Um, although, as I said, I know some of you have already talked about that. And could we start with Jenny again? So sure, thanks, Jane. Um, so my role now at the Digital Preservation Coalition is no longer about getting hands on with digital archives. So I can't um, spend time playing with floppy disks anymore, which is a shame, but I do other things that are, that are fun. Um, and some of those things are about community building and about creating networks where our members can share experiences and discuss digital preservation work. So this is where the human dimension of failure uh, um, comes in for me as well. So digital preservation as a discipline is still very much evolving, and I don't think anyone would really describe this yet as a, as a solved problem. So that means that the best way to move the discipline forward is to experiment uh, and to try things out. Um, sort of stuff that Gentry was, was talking about just now. Um, so we accept that this will lead to failures as well as successes, and that's fine. Um, but the most important thing, I think, is to be able to shout about the failures almost as loudly, if not louder, than uh, as you shout about the successes. So I think this is really how the community learns. However, obviously, people don't always find it that easy to talk about failures. So it can be challenging to admit that something went wrong, and um, particularly if you've invested a lot of time and effort into it. Um, we find that some people perhaps aren't even allowed to talk about failure, so your organisation might not permit it. Some organisations are very um, kind of clear that they don't want people to talk about anything bad that happens. Um, you might not want to admit to your boss that you failed at something, um, let alone the rest of the world. So there are lots of reasons why failure isn't really talked about enough. But I do think this is an opportunity lost because it can be so helpful to others see what didn't work so that they don't then waste time trying exactly the same thing as you and I know this really isn't unique to digital preservation it's the same for any kind of research um, discipline or new discipline so recognizing that this was a problem about six years ago maybe now um, the DPC established a forum specifically for discussing failure and we fondly refer to this as fail club um, so we plan these events to be small and intimate. Uh, we start off by telling people that what happens in Fail Club stays in Fail Club. Um, there are no spectators in Fail Club, so everyone who comes has to share a fail. So you can't just sort of sit on the sidelines and, and judge everybody as they talk about disasters that may have happened. So attendees take it in turns to talk about something that didn't go to plan uh, in as much detail as they like, really, and this can actually be quite therapeutic for people, I think. And after they've shared, um, the rest of the group helps. So it's important when facilitating one of these sessions that um, we really make an effort to, to make sure that this doesn't just turn into a massive moan fest. Because you could you could see that happening, couldn't you? People just like going down and down and down into a spiral of despair about everything that went wrong. So we do need attendees to feel supported and uh, to have some ideas for positive steps forward they can take. So we always try and facilitate these conversations in a positive and useful direction for everybody. So my favourite fail clubs 
held in a little side room of a pub with a couple of bowls of chips and a drink pint perhaps um, with a group of just about six six or seven people and that tends to create the right atmosphere I should I should mention as well these events are, are formerly known as Digital Preservationists Anonymous so we thought people might struggle to get permission from their, their managers if we called it Fail Club officially and um, say oh can I go to Fail Club oh why do you want to go to Fail Club um because we want to keep it confidential and um to make sure that people feel supported but to know that they can share their failures um, in a group and, and get some feedback so one thing to say is is i guess another confession of failure from myself is that um, we struggled to to run with fail club since the pandemic began so we've run a lot of events at the dpc different types of events and all of these have translated really well to to zoom to the online platform we've managed to make them work um, but Fail Club is the one event that we really haven't managed to make work on an online platform. There's something about being face to face in a group, perhaps specifically in a pub, um, that really helps people just to kind of relax and, you know, talk openly, know they're not being recorded, um, for instance. Uh, but I do hope to be able to run a Fail Club uh, face to face later on this year, um, because it's a really nice thing to be able to do. And it's one of my favourite events. So that was it from me. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jenny. Um, Ariana. Um, so I think I did indeed already talk a little bit about the human cost of sustaining and maintaining digital resources, um, but maybe I can say something more about why I think that if, uh, I think specifically about the digital humanities in a quite large sense, but if the digital humanities is serious about embedding the digital into its knowledge production cycle, um, to me, the role of uh, what are now called more and more, at least in this country, in the UK, research technology professional is essential to this endeavor. Um, in Earlier on in October, I published a series of blog posts that drew on input also from all the members of the lab, um, which related to a consultation about the role of research technical professionals in the arts and humanities. So I'm going to point it, add it to the chat as well. Um, so to me, the failure to recognize the fundamental importance of these roles for research and training has caused, unfortunately, several drawbacks to the quality standards, but also to more widely to the research culture of the discipline as such. And I think we can repair that, but we need to do it with some urgency. So I'll name a few of these, to me, quite important failure failures. One is the mismatch between the increasing digital life cycle of projects and the career pipelines that would provide the recognized expertise to design, develop, and maintain those life cycles. So this is mainly, a, I guess, addressed to those um, of you, I, I don't lead teaching programs, but to those of, of you who lead teaching and training programs, I would really work towards creating the profiles of research technical professionals that we need in our disciplines. Um, second failure, the precarity of labor when associated to technical roles. So, for example, can research software engineers in the arts and humanities become a bit more mainstream than a few laboratories or ad hoc figures with no defined roles and career progression? We know that we cannot compete with industry in terms of remuneration, but can we define and offer benefits, including career paths and opportunities systematically across institutions? So if you like, I'm trying to move a little bit from the individual failure to the more systemic failures and how I think we can address them and maybe recognize them is the first step. And then last but not least, I think um, there is a sense of an outdated, if not discriminatory, unfortunately, research culture in the arts and humanities in particular, that's unable or unwilling, I'm not sure, to value the integral part the technical objects have in knowledge production and as a reflection also, um, the integral part of the, of the experts that have an intimate knowledge of how technologies works or can work. And so this is reflected, for example, in our academic promotion system and evaluation frameworks, but also in funding streams and more subtly in attitudes, habits and behaviors. And that's maybe when we go back to the individual and how as individuals we can we can make some small steps to change that. But definitely we need the bigger steps, I think, to address the, the bigger failures. Thanks. Thanks, Ariana. Uh, Sarah. OK. Uh... Thank you very much. I'll just kind of uh, carry on from where Jenny and Ariana have, have ended and just build on, on a few of their, of their points. And um, one of the things that um, 
comes to mind immediately is um, the human the human cost, if I should call it, of of maintaining some of these platforms. Um, speaking to the young man who developed Picture, um, one of the things that that came out was that he he lacked the finances, all right, but he also lack the human resource to help with maintaining um, the platform, you know, cleaning out the bugs, um, responding to queries, but also um, maintaining the server, which was, which was abroad. And he said, because the finances were not coming in, the people he was working with who were fresh out of university like him, soon um, left and said, you see, um, we need to start making money. We, are getting families and we need to take care of them so we can't keep working under uncertain um, circumstances. And so one by one, the team um, grew smaller and before he knew it, he was working alone and that just wasn't feasible. And so uh, one of what happened is that this kind of took a toll on him. He, he, he was so attached to his, um, his his platform and he he didn't want to let go even when he says he got offers from investors to to buy you know to bail him out he just couldn't let go he was too attached because he felt that um they were going to drive him in um in a certain direction that he wasn't ready to 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 go to and so um I would like to, to argue that uh, I think when developers are too attached to, to their products, that might contribute to how long they live or at what point they die. Because um, if finances were his problem and some people were ready to pay uh, to help him out and he couldn't let go because of that attachment that he had to pick sure, then I think that attachment, you could say didn't, didn't, um, didn't benefit the platform. Uh, but that said, um, he also argued that he understood um, that um, trying to compete against the giants like uh, Facebook and WhatsApp, you know, Google was, was really not a good idea. And he said that he actually got a job offer from Google, which he turned down because then they were asking him to, they were hiring him as a developer and that meant that he was going to abandon his own platform. So again, we see that attachment um, kind of not working out for him. And he regretted that he didn't take up the, the Google offer because um, currently he abandoned his, <laughs> his platform and he, he's in formal employment. He's being employed by someone else. And so um, that also leads us to, to think about um, you know, this whole human resource thing. Um, but the other thing that I want to talk about is um, when they were launching um, Pick Show, they, they gave it this identity of the African um, social networking site. And in Uganda, it's cultural to, to identify as African more than we identify as Ugandan. And I dare say that you'll find so many people branding their products, African this, African that, even though it has nothing to do with Africa, it's a purely Ugandan thing. Um, and so he said that um, if, for example, the African Union had picked up Picture and you know, uh, signed up and started promoting it and saying, you know, find us on our Pick show platform, you know, follow us on Pick show. Maybe they would have uh, people would have picked it up. It would have they would have been able to get a return on investment and so on. Just like the big um, international organizations and companies were doing for platforms like Facebook and Twitter. You know, everyone opened uh, an account and uh, BBC says find us on follow us on Twitter. You know, follow us on, on Facebook, like our Facebook page, and so and so. It also brings up the whole thing of identity and how these platforms identify. And so lastly, as a researcher, I find that <laughs> because of the nature of these dead platforms, um, I find myself limited um, 
in the way that I can study um, this whole area of, of platform death. There are just a, uh, maybe a few research methods that I can use like interviews, I can do content analysis, but to a certain extent, because if I'm studying a platform like Enter Uganda, then I'm going to rely on, you know, on the web archive um, website, which will only give me limited access to, to text. And so I'll have to, you know, get behind the scenes, um, talk with them, enter into an agreement if I want more detail. That's and all that yeah, coming from a country like Uganda is, is kind of an uphill task. It can be done, but it's an uphill task. And so I find that um, platform death um, affects us as human beings in that way, I would say. And um, that led me to thinking about the current project that I'm working on, which is uh, archiving COVID-19 experiences in Uganda, because I thought to myself, well, uh, everything that we know about COVID-19 right now is documented in the newspapers. And yes, they're online, they're digital, all right? Currently, we have some access to their, to their archive, but they're now requiring us to sign up and open accounts before we know it. It's going to be, uh, they're going to ask us to subscribe. And so I thought to myself, perhaps I could experiment and um, document uh, COVID-19 experiences and open up the archive, um, you know, to, to society so that other people can, can access these experiences and just see how it goes. So I'm experimenting with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Franny. Yeah, um, I guess there are two ways maybe in which I'll answer this question. Um, the first is sort of what brought me to the, the human dimension that brought me to the project of social media platform closure, um, which is wondering what's left after these sites shut down and how that will sort of influence the individuals and the communities um, that have relied on these platforms and that sort of use them as implicit archives. Um, and, and, you know, how people, how individuals, how historians and how communities will be able to kind of remember some of their cultural output, generally in the absence of that um, cultural output when these social media platforms shut down. So there is that human dimension that sort of brought me to the work. And that's especially, um, yes, against the backdrop of the sort of implicit archiving features of, uh, of these sites and also the sort of um, rhetoric and the promises of social media platforms uh, when they say that anybody's welcome here, this is for everybody to connect. Um, and the other way that um, kind of building on some of the things that have been uh, talked about uh, previously, uh, are the ways that failure was sort of mobilized on and, and, and brokenness was mobilized on an individual level through the interviews of, um, of those former platform employees. Um, and for the folks that I spoke to who, again, were largely based in Silicon Valley, um, they talked about uh, failure and brokenness. They kind of mobilized it into this badge of courage. Um, and it was against the, the, granted, these people were all in very privileged positions, but it was sort of against the uh, boom and bust or precarious uh, cycles of, uh, I don't know, economic activity in Silicon Valley that they had to make any of these failures or the uh, associations with startups that have closed and things like that as this sort of like badge of courage uh, learning experience by fire uh, that they could kind of use as like a war story to talk about their uh, success that followed those failures. Um, so the ways that those, you know, it's not, uh, it was, it, it seemed to be in a different sense than maybe the sort of discourses that happened in Fail Club that you were talking about, Jenny. Um, this was kind of like, uh, you were in the trenches and you, you know, your company failed, but you like learned so much and that brought you to your next, I don't know, multi-million dollar company or something like that. 
Thanks. Thank you. Um, Gentry. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sarah, Franny, Ariana, um, Jenny, and Jane. Uh, this has been great. Uh, and I think I'm just going to kind of speak briefly on the, the human di dimensions as you, as you prompted us, uh, Jane. Um, and the, the context of prototyping the past, I think that, that project, I think we had the luxury to be candid of experimenting uh, and, and prototyping in an academic context where we didn't have, for instance, the external pressures to turn those prototypes into products, right? Say for industry use uh, or for any sort of market. Um, the for the and to speak vulgarly, the the outputs of those prototypes were essentially journal articles and uh, repositories. So we weren't um, thinking of it in, in terms of, of, of again, turning the prototype into something um, that could be produced uh, for market purposes or even for you know educational purposes at scale. Um, I've been working on a different sort of project that's much more infrastructural in its disposition, uh, disposition uh, and, and that's basically around minimal computing, um, collaborating with folks uh, kind of in the last few years, uh, such as Alex Heal and uh, Rupika Razam. Um, and the the idea here that locally in the work that we've been doing on minimal computing, I've been collaborating with Tiffany Chan uh, in the libraries, uh, EVIC libraries. And a key question on the human dimension here is the, the, the immediate and long-term effects of software as a service. Right. And I think um, thinking of that in the human dimension, I th one thing that we've noticed uh, as a potential impact of SAS is um, essentially a, a kind of alienation for, of academics and practitioners from their work. Right. More and more work being remote um, storage uh, choices uh, that, that, that can't be made locally. And so uh, Tiffany and I wrote a piece for DHQ um on this idea of thinking about minimal computing from a labor perspective and so the fundamental question there is is for for tiffany for example what's the process of moving from SAS to FOSS uh to, to free and open software um and, and that's a process that the libraries has done uh, with um with tiffany's contributions uh and what this allows uh, ideally to do is to, to kind of decrease that alienation that's produced by SAS, right? Um, but more broadly, I think another way of thinking about it is taking what we've learned um, in the last you know two decades about failure, about brokenness, about care, repair, and maintenance in digital humanities, and thinking about ways that we might want to degrow the digital right um to however you like to put this to, to slow it down to bring things locally when we need them to afford um, opportunities for customization uh, in library contexts and elsewhere um but also to you know say when we need more time to do things uh, well right and when we need the supports um so you know i'll i'll link to that article just in case uh, you're interested in reading it but what we do there is we just kind of kind of try and outline what a what minimal computing looks like from a minimal pers uh, from a from a labor perspective um rather than solely thinking about it in terms of design like uh, as a feature of a project um how do we think of it instead as a kind of community formation right and a way of organizing around our projects. Uh, and at the end, of, I just kind of, if I can, at the end of that project, we also talk about another UVic project here called Endings um, that's led by Martin Holmes. And I like to think of the labor work that we're doing as a kind of correspondence with the technical orientations of Martin's work uh, and his team's work on Endings uh, and uh, at the HCMC. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. You've all been exemplary in speaking to time. So we have got um, 15 minutes or so for questions. We don't have any questions from the audience yet, but if you do have one, put it in the chat or, oh, we have, um, we have a hand up. JP Asher, what would you like to ask? So first, let me just say thank you. This was wonderful. Wonderful. I applaud all of you. So I think everyone can say this is super useful. Um, but I, I really want to hear an expansion about like kind of this last topic, right? Where we're thinking about um, failure and we're thinking about brokenness. And, and, and I guess the thing I'm thinking about is strategic brokenness. Um, I think about the degree to which like the great editorial product projects of the mid 20th century uh, prevent future work on that. You know, we don't see someone else editing Boyle's letters because it's so good, right? And so like, there's a lot of like repair like you observe brokenness and it is desirable to repair. And I get that feeling, but like, is there also a desire to make broken things so as to leave space for the future to find their scholarship? Or do you think strategically about brokenness in your work? Does that make sense? It's a very yeah. interesting question. Thank you. Who would like to, to pick up on that question of strategic brokenness? You mentioned planned obsolescence as well, Gentry, which I know isn't the same thing, but there, there's a connection there. Um, who would like to start?
Ronnie. Um, yeah, I guess I hope this answer is part of your question, but some of what I've been thinking about and sort of the the aftermath of these platforms is when they are in, even imperfectly preserved, um, some kind of really amazing creative and intellectual outputs have happened from them. So I think of the sort of imperfect preservation of GeoCities by the Internet Archive. Um, and even though they didn't capture everything perfectly, uh, the sort of pieces that they were able to uh, preserve have now been turned into all these kind of like amazing art projects or history projects. Like they've been able to be picked up uh, by uh, lots of folks in interesting ways. And it gives kind of like a, a hopeful ending to even, I don't know, the, an, an imperfect uh, sort of finality to these things that it's not going to stay perfectly ossified how it was before and we can experience GeoCities exactly how it was, but that um, in those, in picking up the pieces, we're able to kind of make something more expansive. Um, so I don't think that was purposeful on the Internet Archive's part, but, uh, you know, they kind of did the best they could and that uh, still led to some, yeah, uh, can amazing I, continued outputs. That's a good, can I ask you like to push it an inch further, Franny, if you can, because what I'm thinking about is comparing the work that GeoCities nostalgia does, which we would not have if GeoCities had been preserved, right? Like NeoCities and all these other systems and you know, minimal computing itself draws on some of that nostalgic energy, right? So the failure, the brokenness of GeoCities created something in culture. And so like, I guess I'm, I'm asking if you can, it's a weird question, like counterfactually, like if you ran the zoo and you were like, here's the strategy for GeoCities, like is the brokenness actually good? Right, like because it creates this rich moment of um, nostalgia that is more powerful than you know the presence of a bunch of websites. Is that? Do you see how I'm kind of? Feel free to dodge it. I don't know if it's a fair. Yes, yeah. I mean that's a really. <laughs> I almost just want to leave that as the answer. Like, um, <laughs> like exactly what you said. That um, I think. Whether it increases nostalgia, I think, is maybe an open question, like maybe in the complete absence, like my space is basically completely ob obliterated. They lost like all, uh, 14 million songs or something. Their entire anything that was ever on my space is basically gone other than the Taylor Swift fans that like archived her music back in the day. So like and in this absence of my space, there's already this like huge there's tons of nostalgia around it. So I don't necessarily think that that's maybe like a the one-to-one -one correlation, but uh, yeah, I guess this is, um, and I forget who was saying this earlier, but that, well, okay, maybe Ariana, you, you said that brokenness is endemic and Jenny, you were talking a little bit about how, uh, you know, you kind of have to be okay with the uh, the imperfect nature of things. So I, I wonder if even if you could have, I think there's no way to design anything perfectly, if that makes sense. So yes, the brokenness is endemic. <laughs> Thanks, Franny. And um, Jenny, I think you wanted to come in and then perhaps we can, we can move on to the next question. Jenny. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. So, so thank you for that. And I do think this the nostalgia of kind of old stuff is really real. And that's what I was trying to get at a bit when I was talking about word star. It's part of the experience is that kind of brokenness and the fact this is a bit obsolete and it's a bit special because we don't get to see it very often. Um, but I was going to say something else about which I think kind of relates to your original question about strategic brokenness. So um something about the acceptable levels of loss, as we call it in digital preservation. So about maybe 20 years ago, when I was working in this field, discussions around digital preservation were really focusing on you know, keeping the highest quali quality version of everything at all costs. But now I'm much likely to turn the conversation um, around to acceptable levels of loss. And that's because everything that we do in digital preservation has got some kind of an impact on the planet. Um, and there's an environmental cost to all of our actions to try and preserve um, 
stuff. So all the storage that we do, like we, we um, store multiple copies of the same content in lots of different locations to try and preserve it. Um, and imagine how much that, that's going to cost the environment when we're talking about huge audiovisual um, collections, for example. So I do now try and steer conversations around to get people to think about how valuable is your content and how, you know, how, much, how important it is, is it to you that that remains unbroken? Um, and do we need to have the same sort of really robust storage um, procedures or preservation procedures for everything? Or can we say, well, this content is not quite so important, so perhaps we can only to keep two copies and accept that risk. Um, so I, th I think that's a kind of a way of talking about strategic loss or strategic brokenness, perhaps not exactly what you were getting at, but uh, hopefully interesting. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, and Anna-Maria Sicani. Um, yes, hi. Thank you very much for your, um, you know, the great inputs. I think it's uh, it's a great discussion. Yeah, I just want to 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 ask. I think it's mainly related to Gentry and uh, uh, Franz, uh, Franny's points um, about um, um, approaching drunkenness and degradation through not such a functional, let's say, perspective, but more um, like a historical or even um, an archaeological one, uh, if I may say so. So I think that this, this example that uh, Gendry um, discussed about the optophone or other kind of almost obsolete media, I think um, these are really, really useful, even if they, they sound a bit um, uh, like um, archaeological <laughs> to us. Um, because, you know, this is the way that our... our our current projects will look like in 10, 100 years. <laughs> so I was um, I was wondering how easily we can adopt such a perspective um, and such an approach in the project, in the digital project, in the digital outputs that we are currently working on. Gentry, would you like to pick that one up? Yeah, sure. I mean, um... I mean, kind of just corresponding with the the DHQ piece that Tiffany and I wrote, I think my initial response here would be um, that it starts first with community organizing. It's a labor question. Uh, and, and from there uh, follows the, the kind of workflows that we can think about in the long term. Um, so if if you're working in a context that expects efficiencies and uh, it still maybe I think still assumes uh, we're calling like Matthew Kirschenbaum's work here that the digital's easy, it's fast. I think that 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 myth still persists. Uh, why is this project taking so long? Um, for example, you, you might be asked sometimes when you're working on a digital project. Um, yeah, is to think about um, ways of organizing locally. Um, nationally, even uh, to to slow down the pace of these projects and to to think about them um, in terms of scope creep and what's feasible. Um, I mean, going back to the the previous question too, that um, one of the ways to get at this is to say um, we can always, if we think, if we start a project with scope creep in mind, and we kind of degrow it from the start and try not to take on all the things. What are the things we can do well uh, and do, uh, you know, persistently? Uh, in a local context, and how over time might you add things to that? Um, thinking of projects as partials that can be developed over time, and how do you develop those parts and expand them um, with with support, ideally from your institution, or in my case, from my province or my my federal government. Um, and that that's an important question, and to kind of put pressure back on systems that expect us to do a lot fast, and saying it can't be done, um, and communicating why. I guess, and, and I guess maybe that sounds a little idealistic, but that's that's my my gut response is to to think more uh, about um, labor and uh, the kind of human dimension of infrastructure and sustainability, um, and not solely think about it as a as a technical function of the projects that we produce. Does anybody else want to come in on that question? No. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say very, very briefly, um, yes, this idea of open discussions and um, honesty, but also um, I think starting from, a, from a, the beginning, discussing in a project, what are the implications if something does not last? So what is it that we want to last and why? And I think making those questions actually open rather than the default. So, for example, we expect these resources to last forever, of course. Really? Why? What are the elements that are really important? And, 
And I think in that sense, again, the technical expertise is not necessarily just about the mechanics of making something work or building something, but exactly raising those questions openly and making people um, critique and criticize those ideas of stability or loss or as other, as other mentioned as well and put them down on the table and maybe prioritize, choose, and, and, and address what are the implications of each choice, each choice in terms of, yes, I don't know, some people mention social justice or they mention labor. There are a lot of ramifications that some of those decisions have on the life cycle for a project and beyond. I was just struck in your answer there about the attachment of the developer that Sarah was talking about in terms of admitting that you can't keep it all forever. And I just wondered, Sarah, if you wanted to, to comment at all on that. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say that indeed when you're, when you're so attached to, to, your, to your product and then you feel that no one will you know, will treat it the way the way you would have. And so you you hold on to it and you don't let go. And so um it, it leads to I think the idea that we, we were discussing earlier of then how how are you dealing with all these things, the moving parts or you know the, the failure of it all, are you, do you have any repair plan? Do you, what, what is your plan really? And is, is, is it there? And so when, when a researcher comes along to, to study your, your project, are you ready to talk to them quite honestly and, you know, try and find solutions maybe to, to maintaining your, your, um, your platform? Yes or no? So, Yes, so that that attachment, um, I think I wouldn't say it's strategic, but because I don't think anyone really sets out to fail, uh, I think we all set out to to succeed. But um, along the way, we find that things don't always work out the way we would like to, and then sometimes, yeah, because we are the innovators, we are too proud to 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 accept and so we hold on and hope that one day the sun will rise and maybe it does but yeah I think the centrality of people to all of this is something that's really emerging very strongly uh, I think we've got time for for one final question from Zarin um Zarin over to you uh could you guys hear me Yes, we can. Oh, thank you, because I'm like using a uh, separate mic. Uh, it, thank you so much. This this entire uh, talk has been so like stimulating and like um, awesome. Uh, so yeah, um, I actually had a, uh, because I come from South Asia, I had a question for like Sarah and Franny in particular. Um, it's actually uh, inspired by my friends, um, Kathleen Legrand's like uh, a PhD, like going about repairing and like, different countries. Um, uh, one of the things I noticed is that because of um, sort of corporate entities in the, you know, in the digital humanities that uh, creates like a hegemonic of knowledge. Uh, this is also what my friend, uh, uh, you know, Kathleen Legrand was also saying. It's like very hard to sometimes repair and preserve like information out in the global South because of the fact that, or, or like in like places where like uh, digital media has um, organically, um, you know, uh, progressed differently. Uh, what do you think like is one of the ways that we can preserve media, which is not like Eurocentric or global North based or like Westernized? Like, what do you think is one of the ways that we can create maybe a different archive of our own to, to say, to maintain and repair these uh, media practices. Thank you. Um, Sarah, Franny, who would like to, to come in on that first, Sarah? Oh, okay, um, I'll go. And uh, thank you very much, Zarin, for that, for that question. And yes, I think um, it's not new that we've been discussing the whole idea of, of knowledge creation and knowledge sharing. Um, and method really in the in the global south and the whole thing about decolonizing knowledge and all those things and so um i would think that um we would kind of ride on these big corporations maybe maybe 
um, continent-wide organizations and coming from Africa, I would, for example, look at the, the AU, the African Union and say that uh, speaking culturally, what can the African Union do to promote innovation, to help um, young innovators um, grow and develop um, platforms and you know, social media, social networking sites that are relevant to the African um, experience. Because you find that um, for a long time, for example, in Uganda, there were very few subscribers, there were very few people subscribed to Twitter. Most people were subscribed to Facebook. And my own observation was that Twitter was very restrictive and we like to talk and um, so people just couldn't summarize what they wanted to say on Twitter. So most people were on Facebook until Facebook was banned uh, last year during the, the presidential uh, campaigns. And then we saw the growth of numbers on, on Twitter. And so now everybody is on Twitter because Facebook is, is, is banned in the country. And so I think that um, as, as um as a continent, and I'm speaking here again um, as a Ugandan from Africa, we could have those big bodies, the AU, the Pan-African Parliament, the regional bodies, you know, promote some of these innovations and help them to grow organically and take on that um, African, that African identity, which will accommodate even our languages. Um, very, very comfortably so that we can communicate in Lusoga, in Uganda, in Kiswahili, you know, very, very comfortably. And so that's what I would, I would argue for that we pick it back on those big organizations and have them boost um, these innovations. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Franny, did you want to, to say anything in response as well? I'll just go very briefly. Thank you for such a wonderful question. Um, I think it's like, something that needs to be thought about. Um, and I, I guess all I can say is that through my project, like some of the ways that these sites based in the US were archived in part was because of existing relationships uh, like within San Francisco, within Silicon Valley, with the internet archive. And you wonder how some of these kind of robust archives are going to be made in the absence of you know, the sort of privileged pre-existing relationships like that, which would absolutely kind of create uh, gaps and holes in some of the, the long-term preservation of platforms. So uh, thank you for that question. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, I hope we can all give a virtual round of applause to our fantastic panelists for such a stimulating and thought provoking discussion. Uh, it was really enjoyable. And I know I've got lots of reading to go away and do as well, uh, following the, the things that you've raised and shared in the chat too. So um, it just remains for me to uh, remind everybody that the next of these seminars uh, will be on the 8th of March at uh, 5 p.m. UK time again and it's uh, on rejected failed funding bids project proposals and job applications and further opportunities for people to shout about failure as Jenny was encouraging us to do and um, Sarah's brilliant example of her failed article about a failed platform <laughs> that she then had to refigure so uh, so thank you all again so much it's been a pleasure to chair this event um, thank you